A very good Sunday morning to my friends from Brumley Baptist Church. Hope you're having a good Lord's Day. If you're listening to this on Sunday morning, if it's maybe a, a little earlier than that on Saturday night, or maybe one day next week, even as you're getting a chance to take a few minutes and study God's word. Whenever you're listening, I pray that your day and week have been good to that point. Ask you that you get yourself a Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, our Sunday school quarterly. We're in session number 10. This is on page 91. We have three weeks to go after this one, uh, but we are working our way through Luke's gospel. We've been doing that. It's our second quarter, working our way through Luke's gospel, and we have made our way to chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. One of the most haunting things I think that Jesus ever said is that Peter would deny that he even knew Jesus. Uh, it was unfathomable for Peter to think that he would ever do something like that, but we all know the story and how those words would come true. Let's dive deep into that scripture tonight and see why it is that that happened. So whether it's this morning, tonight, whenever it may be that you're listening, get your Bible and let's study God's word together. Thank you for joining me here this day. Denying that we know Jesus always leads to sorrow and guilt. And I would imagine most of us would be exactly like Peter. And we would say sitting here today, well, I, I would never, never do anything like that. That would never be who I am. I would never get in a circumstance or a situation where I would deny that I knew who Jesus even was. Well, I, I would imagine that Peter certainly thought he would never get in that circumstance either. But that's where he ended up. Well, how did he get there? And how can we keep ourselves from ever being in that same sort of spot? That's what I want us to think about here, this lesson. As we think about denied as a title, we have to understand the circumstances that led to that denial and not just the denial itself. Jesus willingly went to the cross. Well, that stands in very stark contrast to Peter in this particular story, denying that he even know who Jesus is. Now, Peter is, this is not normally who he was. He was a bold, outspoken, very willing follower of Christ. He was always the one stepping up, wanting to do something. In fact, literally moments before our story tonight, where he denies Jesus, he's tried to murder a Roman soldier to keep them from arresting Jesus. So boldness is part and parcel of who Peter really is. But this story paints him and shows him as quite the opposite of that. Peter is so bold, in fact, that his name is The Rock. It's literally what his name means. Simon is what he's known early in the ministry, and Jesus says that his name will be Peter. Why? Because he'll use the foundation of the boldness and faith of men like Peter and the church will be built on that sort of aesthetic, that sort of boldness. Even though he is unfaithful, this ultimately sets the stage for one of the greatest passages of Scripture, which is in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, where we see Jesus and Peter there reconciling and coming back together. And so you can't have that forgiveness and grace without, sadly, this particular aspect of the story as well. Here are the Scripture that leads Peter to this denial and this moment of truth in his own life. They seized him, they being the Roman soldiers and him being Jesus, and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. When a servant saw him sitting in the light, he looked closely at him. She said, this man was with him too, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. About an hour later, another kept insisting, this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. 
So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. It's a haunting passage of scripture and a convicting passage of scripture as well. And I'll allude to that as we wrap up our message here in just a few moments. Let's look at three main points from our passage today. And first notice, how did Peter get to denial? Well, it starts with distance. It says, they seized him and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. The plot against Jesus had grown in steps and intensity ever since his arrival in Jerusalem back in chapter 19. After the triumphant entry, literally, the Roman uh, guards, the centurions, the scribes, the Pharisees, all of these people that were not friends with each other came together for a common cause of hating and ultimately wanting to rid the world of Jesus. This plan has been put into action by the time we get to chapter 22. They have arrested him in the garden while Jesus and his followers were there to pray. They've seized him and led him away. That, that conveys the idea of force. That they have not calmly and quietly kind of escorted Jesus to the trial. They've grabbed him. They've been rough and physical with him. And they've led him away and taken him to the, high, the house of the high priest. The high priest at that time was probably Joseph Caiaphas. He was the ruler from AD 18 to AD 36. The house of the high priest was usually a palace, a villa, had a large courtyard in the middle, uh, would have had open sides so that uh, we see later in the passage, Jesus and Peter were able to make eye contact. And I'll allude to that in just a few minutes. At this point, Jesus was being prepared to go before the Roman governor, Pilate. Uh, Luke was informing us that the religious and political authorities were working together to bring all of this to an end. Rome would be the political authorities. Caiaphas here, the high priest, would be the religious authorities. Again, they did not like each other. They did not work together. But in this case, they make an exception because they have what they deem to be a common enemy in Jesus. The religious establishment hates Jesus because they claim he's committed blasphemy. He's claimed he's God. The political establishment will come to hate Jesus because they will be convinced by the religious establishment that Jesus is trying to start a revolt or an uprising, talking about himself being a king and his work being of the kingdom of God. What is most significant in this passage to me, in this section especially, is what happens at the end of verse 54. Luke tells us that Peter was following, but he was following at a distance. Luke is a historian. He's a doctor. He's an intelligent, intelligent man. He is a stickler for the details, the small little bits that really give extra life to this story. Verse 54 gives us that extra bit of insight. Peter's still with Jesus, but he's with him at a distance. He wants to be close enough to know where Jesus is and know what's going on and what's happening, but he does not want to be close enough to be associated with Jesus. And friend, if that is not a characterization of the 21st century church, of the church, I should say, in 2021, if no, knowing Jesus and wanting to be close enough to see him, but not close enough to be associated with him. That is the church today. Everybody wants to know where Jesus is when a school shooting happens, when something bad takes place. Why would God let this happen? Why does God not bless our nation? We, we want him close in that way, but we don't want to be associated with him when he says, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. They don't want to be associated with him when his word and his command causes us to be called names and pointed out and scorned and ridiculed by a lost world called bigot and narrow-minded and all the things that the lost world will call us if we stand for the truth of God's word. Following Jesus at a distance is the surest way to get yourself in a world of trouble. Because I promise you, it won't appease the world to follow him as long as you're at a distance. And I promise you as well, it certainly will not appease Jesus Christ himself. Jesus doesn't accept followers at a distance. He wants those who are close to him in part of that inner circle. When you get at a distance, unfaithfulness is your closest companion. 
there will be situations in all of our life when our faithfulness to Christ is going to falter. That's going to be true of all of us. But when we put ourselves at a distance away from Christ, those situations will seem to come all the more often. It's a bad place to be, dear friends, to trying to follow Jesus, but not be close enough to Jesus. You can't do both. Jesus said himself, a house divided against itself will not stand. When he spoke about money, he said, you cannot serve two masters. Well, that principle is true here. You cannot serve the world and serve God. We just preached about that last Sunday morning. Jesus said the world hates Jesus, hates his followers. Then why would, why do we want to be accepted by it so much? Distance is how you get in a place of denying Jesus. Look at denial here in verse 56. When a servant saw him sitting in the light and looked closely at him, she said, this man was with him too, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. About an hour later, another kept insisting, this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Peter doesn't go unnoticed for long. The light of the fire shows his face to those who are gathered around it, who are bloodthirsty, wanting to see what they do with this Jesus. If they put him on trial, do they scourge him? Do they kill him? And so they're hanging out, being nosy. They're hanging out around the fire near the trial of Jesus for the same reason people go out on a drive after a tornado comes through a town or there's bottlenecking after a car accident when everyone wants to go look and see what has happened. The first person who identified Peter in the dim light was a servant woman. Peter entered uh, earlier in this same gospel in chapter 18, this same servant who was a doorkeeper and let Peter inside when John requested it. So she's probably seen him before. So she now sees his face in the fire line. And she says, wait, this man was with him too. I saw it. I was there. I know it. She looked closely at him. Jesus was so important to Peter. Back in Luke chapter 9, it was Peter that first confessed Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. Now Peter is identified as one of the followers of Jesus. Nope, I don't even know him. This is an absolute denial on Peter's behalf. Woman, I don't know him. Not just I'm not his follower, I don't even know who he is. Peter was probably fearful at this moment, seeing Jesus on trial, wondering what might happen to him next. Again, the disciples were hoping that Jesus was going to overthrow Rome, get rid of them, set them free, give them that kingdom that he had preached about so much, still not fully grasping that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. This is the denial passage, but the word denied only appears in verse 57. After this, Luke just records what Peter says each time. Now he denies him all three times, but this is the first time where we see the word denial and the only time we see the word denial. Peter then drew attention from someone else who said, you're one of them too. The crowds knew who Jesus was. They knew who Jesus' disciples were. They had seen them all throughout this week in the city, but for the last three years, they had seen Jesus and his followers. You're known by the company you keep. Church, listen, for better or for worse, you're known by the company you keep. And it's something I try to pound into Hannah and Eli and into my kids at school. Who you're with is who you're going to be known by. Well, yeah, well, Jesus ate with sinners. Well, when you live like Jesus, you can go eat with sinners too. You know, we, we have to be above board. We have to have high, high standards because we are all, starting with this preacher, so impressionable. That's why I love being around God's people because it makes me a better servant of God. An hour later, Peter digs in deeper. A third person presses him and insisted with certainty, this man was certainly with, with him. Look, he is a Galilean. Galileans had distinct clothing, identifiable accents. They would stick out like a Southern person might stick out in New York City, here in Jerusalem, quite honestly. And for the third time, Peter says, man, I don't know anything you're talking about. Leads to the final point, defeat. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. 
Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord as he had said to him before, the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. As I mentioned at the start of the lesson, apparently this courtyard area was accessible, at least visually, to some of the outside area. It was far away, and you probably couldn't have heard what was happening in the trial, but there was some way, some opportunity where Jesus and Peter make eye contact. Can you imagine how far in the ground Peter wanted to dig a hole and disappear? Immediately after he says it, the third time, he sees Jesus' eyes the eyes of the son of man, the eyes that Peter has looked into day after day after day for three years. The eyes that Peter locked with when he walked on the water, the eyes that glowed a flame on the Mount of Transfiguration, the eyes that shed tears over the death of Lazarus, those eyes, Peter and Jesus lock eyes again. And when Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes meet, Peter's eyes fill up with tears. The victorious Christian life is not a sinless life. It's a repentant life. And proof that Peter will repent is that he went outside and he wept bitterly. Corinthians tells us that there's two kinds of sorrow. There's sorrow because you got caught. And then there's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. There's worldly sorrow that other people know that you messed up. Then there's godly sorrow when you realize that God knows you've messed up. And the Bible is clear, only godly sorrow leads to repentance. In this moment, Peter experiences godly sorrow. What can we learn from this? One, we should never ever distance ourselves from Jesus. Jesus said it himself, if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my father in heaven. Don't try to follow Jesus at a distance. Number two, we can expect to be identified with Christ. And if we're not, then something's wrong. If we're not being identified by the world as a follower of Jesus, then we're not doing this Christianity thing right. Because we should be different. We should be notably different, markably different. We ought to look different. As the Galileans were identified by their clothing and by their accent, by how they looked and what they said, so should Christians be. Not by our clothing and our accents, but by the way we live, the way we show ourselves to the world, and the way we speak. Believers will be held accountable if we deny Jesus. Peter is going to be held accountable. But I would remind all of us that even in being held accountable, there's mercy and forgiveness from Christ. Thank you for joining me to study this scripture. Love to see you with us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings at Brumley Baptist Church. Have a good and godly day, and until I see you again, go serve your King.